All right, three or five. Here we go. Italian precision. So, um, and we already have almost uh, we're approaching 200 attendees for today's webinar. That's really great to see. That's the great uh, advantage of webinars. But it also because we have a great talk and a great speaker. We woke up very early. Um, Fran Moore is a system professor um, at UC Davis uh, uh, in California. So it's just five minutes past six a.m. in the morning. Thanks, Fran, for waking up early. We solved technical problems just 10 minutes ago with microphones. Um, so it was, I guess, uh, pretty rough uh, waking up. But it's really great to have to have Francis uh, talking to us about one of the greatest issues on the economic assessment of climate change, which is how to incorporate uh, non-market uh, damages and uh, the value of ecosystems in benefit cost assessment of climate policies. This is obviously a very important part of why we care about climate. And yet it is often poorly understood uh, and poorly incorporated in existing assessments, cost benefit assessments. Uh, and Francis, uh, she's perfectly equipped for speaking about this. She's, she has a very strong curriculum. She has done a lot of terrific work, empirical work. I think she's great on both the empirical side and the modeling side, which is very rare. She's done a lot of terrific work uh, on the econometrics of climate change, especially on agricultural sectors and but more broadly, but also published uh, work, including the one she's presenting today, um, model related work, which is quite unique. Uh, I just a couple of, uh, of, of, of slides. Uh, this is um, a sweep seminar with three E's. Uh, it's a webinar series uh, uh, that started a couple months back by uh, ourselves here, the European Institute on Economics and the Environment, the Grenoble called the Management in France, ZEW in Mannheim in Germany and the uh, CEPE, the Center for Energy Policy and Economics in ETH Zurich. Um, so it's four European institutes uh, uh, interested in the research applied to environmental and energy problems and climate problems. Um, and, um, and we created this, this webinar series, which uh, is, is, is obviously creating uh, and having quite success given the number of attendees we have today. Uh, how is going to work? Friend will talk for about 40 minutes or so, um, and then uh, you can participate in the QA sessions if you, as written in the slides, just use the questions tab. And then what I'm going to do is collect those questions, uh, collate them if needed, and then uh, uh, ask those questions to Francis. And we're going to do that at the end. But if you have pressing uh, questions or clarification questions, you should also be doing, and you can do it in the chat in the questions tab throughout the, uh, the, the, the talk and at some point throughout uh, the talk friend will stop uh, for clarifying questions if needed. Otherwise, for most of the questions, uh, we'll do the QEA at the end. Again, this is the SWEEP webinar series. We have uh, several other seminars coming up. The next one is indeed in a week time. We typically have Wednesday, always have uh, webinars on Wednesdays at 3 p.m. European time. So next Wednesday, October 21st, uh, uh, optimal fuel taxation with suboptimal health choices. Um, Linus Matau from Oxford University. Look forward to that as well. With that, I would just uh, give the floor to Fran uh, for her talk. And thanks everyone, to hundreds of you for being here and, and listening to, to Fran. <laughs> Thanks, Max, for that, that, that great introduction. Um, and thanks for the invitation to be here today. Um, so I think you can see my screen. The only problem is I can't see my screen. One second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. OK, OK. Um, so yes, yeah, th thank you. Thank you for coming today. And thanks for the opportunity to present this work. So this is um, joint work with and largely led by um, Bernie, um, Bernie Bastian Olvera, who is a PhD student in, uh, in geography at, at UC Davis. And so full credit to, uh, to Bernie for kind of um, doing a lot of um, the, the, the work and, and, and it's a kind of full collaboration between, between the two of us. Um, so one second, okay. So what's the, what's the overall motivation for, for this paper I'm gonna talk about today? Well, we know that the um, disruption of ecosystems by climate change will be direct, long-lasting, and widespread. So the, the effects on natural systems from climate change are kind of um, some of the most immediate and obvious impacts of climate change. 
For instance, at three degrees of warming, it's estimated that between one and 40% of global terrestrial vegetation will be severely disrupted, um, and about 8% of species will be at risk of extinction. But these, and so these changes are massive, right? Um, but the implications for human welfare are poorly constrained. Uh, and I think it's fair to say are kind of not, not kind of particularly well represented in our current estimates of the cost of climate change. If you think about the value kind of derived from ecosystems, there's this concept of total economic value in which you can think of um, the total value derived from natural systems kind of falls um, broadly into these two categories, right? Kind of use values, which are kind of consumptive uses that that come from uh, that come from nature, and so this is broadly classed as this category of kind of ecosystem services, and then non-use values, right, which are non-consumptive, right, um, but they're no nonetheless kind of um, real values that that people hold over just the simple existence um, of certain species or certain natural systems. Um, or the kind of the bequest value, the ability to kind of pass those, pass those natural systems down uh, to future generations. So if we think about use values, uh, just thinking about what these values are and kind of how climate change might play into their, their, um, their value. So the type of use values you might think about could be things like recreation, kind of direct aesthetic appreciation, uh, kind of classic ecosystem services like pollination, like water quality, uh, or timber production. And climate change is going to, because it moves, degrades, and disrupts natural systems, um, it's going to it's going to also impact the, the the kind of quality and quantity of the ecosystem services that these natural systems are providing. And so this is this is kind of something that's already playing out around the world. And so these are. For example, this is a paper showing documenting these widespread tree mortality events that have been um, many of them have been kind of linked to climate change, either via drought uh, or via via pest outbreak. On the non-use side, right, we have these existence and bequest values, right. Often, this is thought of in terms of uh, in terms of extinctions. Um, under business as usual emissions by 2100, something between 10 and 15 percent of species are expected to be committed to extinction just by um, the shifting of the um, the kind of climate envelope um, in which that species can exist. Um, there, there's obviously large uncertainty around this number. There are reasons why it most be, might might most be might be high and might be low. Um, but it's certainly kind of massive compared to, say, the kind of extinction rate over the historical record. And again, this is something we're kind of seeing playing out already, where these are just some examples. So in the United States, the polar bear was kind of listed on the Endangered Species Act, uh, primarily due to um, climate change threats to its habitat. The North American wolverine has also been proposed to listing largely due to climate change effects. Um, and then there's, there is this documented species level extinction of the golden toad in Costa Rica that at least possibly is linked to climate change, although there is debate around that. So the question we're asking here is how does uh, accounting for climate change impact on natural capital and the resulting effects on welfare affect the social cost of carbon and welfare maximizing emission pathway? So we're, we're relying here kind of the base model that we're going to kind of um, modify to incorporate these natural system impacts um, is the DICE 2013 model. And I know many people here are probably kind of super familiar with DICE, um, but there may be people, people who aren't. So I'm just going to um, kind of quickly go over this kind of sketch out kind of what exactly the DICE model does. Um, so DICE, the DICE model has a kind of um, a production function based on capital and labor that together with total factor productivity uh, produce economic output. That output is split between uh, investment and consumption, where investment kind of replenishes this de depreciating stock of capital, uh, and consumption kind of contributes to welfare, where, where that welfare function has this kind of diminishing marginal uh, returns to consumption. But output also kind of is associated with greenhouse gas emissions, and then those greenhouse gas emissions produce warming in a kind of very simple uh, climate model. 
Um, and then this is a damage function, right? Where the damage function, uh, warming, um, affects output, reduces output. And then there's this, um, to optimize this model, right? You, the control variable is mitigation, where at some cost, um, you can reduce emissions so as to control temperature. Um, okay, so that's the DICE model. Um, and so I'll talk briefly about kind of three main um, bodies of literature that we're, we're kind of contributing to and relying on in this work. And so firstly, there's this, um, there's this prior literature on this multi-good utility in DICE. Um, and so there's, there's several papers going back kind of over 20 years um, pointing out that non-market goods, um, separating non-market goods from kind of more, more general consumption goods in the utility function in DICE um, can have large implications for damages and, in, and can significantly increase the optimal mitigation rate. Um, and so this kind of, this, the, the, there's a whole series of these papers that I've listed here. A lot of them are not super well known. But you kind of go back and read them and kind of starting with this paper by Richard Hall in the mid 90s, they kind of keep making this the same point, which is that this is a really important distinction um, to do with how um, the, these, um, these non-market goods are dealt with in the utility function. And it's something that potentially is kind of really underappreciated in terms of a structural assumption uh, within DICE that drives uh, some of its conclusions. Um, and, and part of what's going on here is that if environmental goods grow slower than consumption goods, so consumption goods have this kind of indice, and it's not totally exogenous, but a largely exogen, exogenous kind of increase in, um, in, in output and in per capita consumption, then environmental goods are not growing that fast and relative prices rise over time and the damages to the environmental goods become relatively more costly. And this is particularly pronounced if the environmental goods are luxury goods, so they become more valued uh, as people become richer. Uh, and in a recent paper, so people are kind of, in, there's a really nice kind of really comprehensive um, uh, kind of new uh, analysis of this using DICE um, by Drop and Hansel um, in AEJ Economic Policy, and kind of their central estimate is that this effect in, in, increases the social cost of carbon by, by 50%. So what we do here um, is we use a three good nested utility function where there's a bundle of consumption goods, market uh, kind of market and non-market goods, um, and that those contribute to utility along with these non-use goods. Um, and so there's this, we're kind of expanding on this, the previous literature to do this kind of three good uh, nested utility function, but a lot of the insights are kind of uh, already here from that piece are already here in these other papers. Secondly, we, we rely a lot on this kind of literature on natural capital accounting and kind of comprehensive wealth accounting. So the framework of comprehensive wealth accounting acknowledges that there's kind of three main forms of capital supporting human welfare, manufactured capital, uh, human capital, and natural capital. And the, so the World Bank, the OECD, as well, well as several national governments um, are kind of incorporate, are pursuing some form of environmental accounting, kind of integrating measures of natural capital into their national national account. Um, and actually, this kind of speaks to an, this older debate from um, kind of around the 1970s within economics um, about kind of what exactly the kind of production function kind of is, right? And so there are these papers kind of from that period that, that are having this debate over whether is a, is a kind of right uh, production function if it's the two-factor function that has labor and capital, or is there, is there a three-factor production function that has la um, labor, capital, and the natural kind of land or resources or some other factor? Um, and it was kind of at least, you know, you know so Nordhaus, there's a paper by Nordhaus where he's kind of um, thinking about this question. Um, and he kind of came down, obviously for DICE at least, on, in terms of on this two-factor production function, right, where you only have capital and labor. Um, but it's at least, I think, worth now kind of revisiting this question um, in this context of these kind of more recent work on natural capital accounting, um, as well as kind of um, these specific questions over how climate change affects this, um, this natural capital. And so this paper then is going to split out the natural capital stock as a factor of production of both market and non-market goods, 
and it's the sole source of these non-use goods of these existence values. And then finally, um, we're also speaking to this literature on the question of how damages kind of uh, affect human welfare in a model like DICE. Um, and so damages in the standard DICE model fall on production, meaning that they are by and large not cumulative. So the temperature rise in that period kind of affects, affects uh, production and therefore welfare in that period, but mostly doesn't have a strong persistent effect over time. This is a kind of um, a slight um, uh, simplification because because of the endogenous capital formation in dice, there is a fairly small uh, persistent effect, um, but it's but it's not particularly large. Um, but if instead you kind of, the, you you allow these uh, climate change damages to affect the determinants of growth, um, then these the the effects of the effects of warming are persistent. Um, and they uh, create these kind of, they accumulate over time uh, to produce very large changes. And kind of about five years ago, there was like a series of papers, including some of my work with Delavane Diaz that was kind of pointing this out. Um, so in previous work, um, the way we, for example, we implemented um, the growth rate damages was that we um, allowed a warming to affect um, changes in the total factor productivity. Uh, so we allowed, climate change to affect the total fact of productivity growth rate um, and, or to increase the capital depreciation rate. And both of those will give these kind of persistent growth rate effects. So in this paper, we're kind of allowing for a different kind of persistent effect on welfare, which allows the, by allowing climate change to affect the stock of natural capital. So we're gonna add a damage function directly from climate change to natural capital, kind of representing what I talked about originally, which is this um, uh, you know, what we've already seen, which is the fact that climate change, you know, is known to, is going to be having the kind of um, direct effects on natural systems. Okay. So the outline for the rest of the talk, so I'm going to describe the model uh, in, uh, kind of go through exactly the changes that we make to, to DICE, um, and then the parameterization. And then I'll uh, kind of pause and uh, uh, take a moment for questions uh, and then go on to talking about the results, um, our sensitivity analysis and Monte Carlo simulations, um, and then um, the question of defensive investment. Um, okay, so model description. So this is the, the DICE model. So we start with the DICE 2013 model. Um, and this is kind of my the broad schematic of that model that I just talked about. I'm gonna add on kind of layer by layer um, these additional kind of pathways um, by which climate change affects, affects welfare. So, um, and what we do is we kind of build these up into the model one by one. Um, uh, and so I'm gonna show you each of those additional steps and what that allows us to do is kind of decompose in the, the kind of, for the full model, which we call green dice, we can decompose kind of which of these damage pathways is kind of responsible for how much change in, in welfare. So the first change, and so this is in a specification we're calling kind of market goods. Um, we simply kind of split out natural capital from the from the capital stock, um, and allow, and we add this damage function from temperature to natural capital. Um, and so we modified then the production function to allow for three goods. So n here is natural capital um, instead of the classic two good production function. And we also kind of allow the damage function that um, allows kind of temperature to affect the stock of natural capital. Secondly, the second specification is a all use value specification um, where we add a kind of ecosystem service um, uh, good. Um, and so this is also produced. And so there is a production function for this ecosystem services good. Um, where this production function kind of looks really similar to the, the market good, um, but what you notice is that um, gamma 3 and gamma 2 have been changed. Um, and gamma 3 is much, much less than gamma 2. And so what this is saying is that, okay, um, well, you need um, a lot more natural capital, basically, to be producing these kind of non-market uh, ecosystem services that are kind of much more important factor of production. And then the utility function uh, in this all use value specification is this um, CES um, utility function, kind of this is um, the same as what 
um, kind of hull and sterner use and sterner in person, um, as well as drop and handful. So it's this kind of two good utility function that's been um, explored uh, in this literature before. And then finally, in the full green dice model, we also add a pathway by which natural capital, kind of just the existence of this natural capital, um, appears directly in the utility function. Um, and so here we kind of, our utility function exposed a little bit, but what this is, is this kind of nested, um, nested um, three good utility function where you have um, this bundle of consumption and environmental goods, um, as well as this, um, this guy, so NT uh, to the gamma four, which I'll talk about what exactly those parameters mean, um, but that's this kind of natural capital appearing uh, in this utility function. Um, and, and can just the existence of it contributing directly to welfare. Okay, so that's the full green dice model. So let me talk about parameterization because this is a bit of an adventure. So um, as you can probably tell, there's an awful lot of um, new parameters in this. A lot of them are, you know, yeah, not, not full transparency here. They are really difficult to get any kind of empirical traction on. Um, so how do we go about doing this parameterization? Well, firstly, we keep the late, so, so I'll talk through our kind of production and then um, the preference parameters and then the damage function. So for the production side, we kind of fix the labor elasticity. So we fix gamma one at this its value in dice, which is 0.7. Uh, we maintain uh, the constant return to scale. So we require that gamma one, gamma two, and gamma three equals one. Um, and then we jointly parameterize the initial capital stock and gamma three um, using um, previous estimates from the World Bank and from others um, that that look at how um, that, that basically go through kind of different countries and and look at how um, and I do this accounting exercise basically of figuring out okay how much natural capital is there relative to manufactured capital as well as what is the TFP growth rate with and without accounting for natural capital. Because TFP is this kind of residual, right, after you account the changes in the factor of production. So if you think that, well, natural capital is changing, natural capital is a factor of production, then that changes your, your TFP growth rate. Um, and using those two, and this is something Bernie figured out, <laughs> um, you, can, you can basically constrain uh, gamma, gamma three, and then because we have this requirement that they add to one, you can kind of constrain gamma two. Um, and so what that gives us, it gives us an initial natural capital stock that's about a quarter of manufactured capital, um, as well as a gamma three of 0 0.01. Okay, so preference parameters. So the, um, the substitution parameters, the faces here, so these are taken um, from a, uh, a, uh, a paper by Mark Drop, uh, where he shows that if you kind of, um, uh, under certain conditions, you can, you can estimate the substitutability between kind of non-market and market goods by looking at the income elasticity. Um, of those goods. And so he kind of goes through and based on the estimates of income elasticity, he kind of calculates what these um, substitution parameters are. And so we divide um, his, um, um, the, the papers he reviews in that into kind of use goods and non-use goods. We just take the average um, and that's what we use to kind of constrain these, these data parameters. Um, and so you see here that these, we're, kind of, we're treating these as um, partial substitutes. Um, so the shares of these goods in the utility function are really um, not constrained. Um, and like previous previous work has pointed this out too, that this is something is really difficult to figure out what um, these these kind of share parameters should be. Um, so we follow uh, Hurl and Stern and we just assume kind of point one for both of those. Um, and a lot of these are kind of then varied uh, in the sensitivity analysis because you can see that um, th they don't have a ton of kind of um, empirics behind them. And again, gamma four. So gamma four is kind of you know how how it, as, as as natural capital grows, kind of what effect does that have on utility? Uh, we assume here 0.5. Um, so that so basically that's a kind of diminishing marginal benefit of large natural capital stock. So it's kind of you know changes in natural capital are most valuable when you don't have much natural. Okay, and so finally the damage function. 
So um, the damage function, um, what's important here is to try and kind of take dice damages in which everything is kind of rolled into one, um, and then to split out what is a kind of e the ecosystem kind of component of that um, and what is, uh, you know, what's kind of standard kind of consumption uh, damages that just fall on output. Um, and so we do this um, by, uh, we kind of, we follow some methodology from Howard and Sterner where they go back, they, they look at kind of um, this set of estimates, most of which kind of are supporting um, the, the damage function in DICE. So they go back to the original studies and they kind of, um, they do a meta-analysis of kind of what is driving kind of these estimates of, of, um, uh, of damages at different levels of warming. Uh, and one thing you could do with that is you can say like, okay, well, does this study include non-market damages or not? Um, and you can add that as a kind of an, in, an interaction term. And so um, that gives you an estimate of, okay, all the studies that are, that are supporting the, the DICE damage function, uh, what fraction, of, you know, what is the role of non-market goods in driving those damage estimates? And so if you do this, you, um, you estimate that about 68% uh, of damages are non-market. Um, but what we're worried about here is, well, it's not just non-market damages we're interested in. This is like a kind of natural capital uh, story here. And so, you know, a big chunk of those um, uh, non-market damages are going to be mortality costs. Um, and so we try and deal with that by kind of, and this is where it gets, oh yeah, really shaky. Um, but we, um, uh, we use this result from Shang et al. And so this is only for the United States, but they do this kind of comprehensive accounting of like um, the different damage sectors as well as mortality. They estimate the mortality is about 20% of total damages. And so kind of combining those two things, we kind of estimate that natural capital damages in the DICE damage function are about half. Basically, um, we do vary this in a sensitivity analysis, um, and so we we apportion the damages that way, and then we fix the at 2.5 degrees warming, which is the dice calibration point, um, and then we um, fix the welfare losses at this 2.5 degree, um, and we fix that apportionment of damages, and that can then kind of together that like constrains what that parameter in the damage function is. Um, oops, sorry. An important thing to note, though, is that what we're doing here is we're kind of forcing the contemporaneous welfare change at like 2.5 degrees of warming uh, to be the same. But because of the persistent nature of these damages, the total welfare losses on any given temperature pathway are going to be much larger in these guys. And so, this, so DICE kind of says like, well, the losses at 2.5 degrees uh, of warming are this. But it doesn't really say anything about the persistence. The persistence just kind of um, arises from the structure of the model, right? And in particular, in DICE, it's this endogenous capital formation. And here we have a different type of persistence, right? Because we have damages affecting natural capital. And so what that means is that the total welfare losses are going to be, um, are going to be much larger. Okay, so this is a good point for me to pause um, and take uh, and to ask Max if there are kind of any questions here. <clears throat> Thanks, Fran. I th yeah, there's a question by Richard Tall. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, uh, Richard is asking whether there's investment in natural capital or not. Yes, um, good question, Richard. Um, that is what I will talk about right at the end. So this is going to, I'm going to get to this in my defensive investments piece. So it's not in the main kind of green dice model, but we allow for it um, and kind of explore what that does. All right, well then we have to, to just wait a few more minutes. There are other questions about damage functions um, by Charlotte. I hope this has been clarified in your formulation. Just to be clear, you're using them, uh, the Howard and Sterner for parameterization. Um, it's not their parameterization, but it's that we rely on the, the fact that they kind of pulled out all these estimates um, in a very systematic way. Uh, and then we, um, we, we kind of do, uh, we do this regression that basically just splits the, um, the damages into ones that are, you know, what, what is kind of coming from market only studies versus what is the difference then when you add these studies that include non-market damages. But then we apply that split to the original kind of dice calibration. 
All right. Yes, please go ahead. Okay, got it. Um, okay, so um, okay, so results. Um, so here you're seeing the main result, which is the uh, kind of optimal uh, carbon tax um, for these different model specifications. Um, and you're seeing four different lines, right? So, and I labeled them at the end. And then in, in parentheses, you have the um, dollars per ton, um, the, the social cost of carbon um, in 2020. And so the bottom is giving you this kind of standard dice model. Um, and, uh, and then we're kind of adding these different damage pathways, right, to kind of build up to the full green dice. Um, and so what you see is kind of, you kind of add this, this um, natural capital as a factor in the production of market goods, um, and that by itself kind of um, more than doubles uh, um, uh, the social cost of carbon. Um, when you add these kind of ecosystem service goods, again, it kind of, again, uh, almost doubles. Uh, and finally, kind of the full green dice specification, adding those non-use values um, kind of doesn't do, um, um, kind of adds a little bit again, so that the full change is about, is kind of, this increases by uh, the total social cost of carbon from standard dice to green dice kind of increases by uh, over 500%. Um, the gray lines here are showing you um, the range um, from our Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, sorry, not the range; it's the interquartile range um, from our Monte Carlo simulations. And so you see this kind of asymmetric error where there's kind of potentially kind of much higher um, and maybe a little bit lower. But it's kind of the error bars kind of don't really get close to to dice, at least in this interquartile range. <clears throat> And so this, if you apply this optimal carbon tax with the dice kind of mitigation cost function, um, then you get these uh, emissions trajectories, right? And so at the top, you this dotted line is standard dice, very classic dice result, right? Where you have this kind of gradually um, slowing of emissions growth that like, leads to emissions peaking in mid-century um, and then gradually declining uh, over the course of the later, um, later the century. Um, these higher damages um, in in green dice that coming from the, the, these natural capital effects lead to much kind of more rapid emissions reductions that kind of eliminate emissions by about mid-century. Um, and in terms of temperature, um, what they do is they they change this kind of welfare maximizing uh, temperature at the end of the 21st century um, from this kind of about three degrees to kind of under two degrees, and in some cases under 1.5 degrees, which is really difficult though. I know probably a lot of people have like played around with dice and different things. It's really difficult to get dice to do this. <laughs> um, it's uh, like this emissions from behavior is like robust to a lot of things. Um, but once you start introducing these like kind of persistent chain, persistent damages, um, you know, it really starts to give qualitatively different behavior. Okay. So those are the main results. Um, and now let me talk a lot about uncertainty. <laughs> um, and so we, so many of these new parameters, like I said, are highly uncertain. Um, and so we performed two explorations of this uncertainty. So firstly, there's this one at a time sensitivity analysis. So that's where we kind of, we take the, the green dice, right? And we, we've got these eight new parameters. And then we also add some of these classic kind of uh, parameters that people look a lot Look at look at a lot in climate in sensitivity analysis, like the climate sensitivity, the period of time preference, and the relative risk aversion. Um, and we just vary them, so we get, we vary them between kind of high and low values. In some cases, those that those uh, values kind of come from various like pieces of the literature. In other cases, they're just kind of arranged that we came up with. And then secondly, so that shows you the sensitivity fixing everything else. Then we also, oh, sorry, it should be a Monte Carlo, not a Monte Carlo sampling. Um, but we do, uh, we do a thousand kind of draws from these kind of, from these different, um, from these parameter ranges, from all the green dice parameters. Uh, and what that does, and then we, we optimize the model to these new parameter estimates. Um, and what that does is it allows for these uncertainty arising from kind of various interactions um, of, of different parameters. Um, you know, and then to understand this Monte Carlo output, um, you know, because you, you have this a thousand samples and you're trying to figure out, okay, well, what parameters are most important in driving that? 
that the variance in the in the model output. So we um, we fit a random forest model, and so what that does is it's going to explain the model output um, flexibly as a function of these input variables, and including kind of allowing for uh, various types of interactions and nonlinearity. So it's kind of a flexible way to like explore this complex model output. Um, so this is the result from the one at a time sensitivity analysis. You can see the utility parameters, production parameters, damage to natural capital, as well as these kind of reference um, parameters. Um, and then the solid line is showing you the green dice specification, and then the dashed line is showing you the, the dice 2013. Um, and so um, on the left is the optimal carbon tax, on the right is a kind of welfare maximizing temperature in 2100. Um, and so one thing to note is that, yes, there's, there's a range, right? So the, the sense is that this kind of, um, that this uncertainty uh, is substantial. Um, but, you know, really, we don't really see anything that, that approaches um, that or kind of overlaps with the DICE result, right? So this is kind of qualitatively different, uh, even given this, this parametric uncertainty. Um, we see kind of the period of time preference, like others have pointed out many times, is important in driving results, right? So there's high sensitivity to that. But there are also kind of substantial sensitivity to the valid factors, like in particularly the damage, damages, um, so the damages to natural capital, as well as these kind of factors that deter, kind of collectively determine how important natural capital is in the production function. Um, so this is our, and then this is our random forest analysis. Um, so um, the way a random forest works, it kind of like, um, it repeatedly like splits the data and then um, it creates this tree, which is like a decision tree almost, mm -hmm. um, that partitions the data in a way that's kind of best able to like explain the variance. Um, and so what you can think of is like the, the variables that get chosen first uh, in that tree to partition the data are kind of like the most important in explaining the variance. So one way of understanding random forest output is to look at, on average, kind of where in the tree does a certain variable first appear. And the higher it, are, the higher it is in a tree, um, the um, more important that variable is in driving the, the output. And so again, we're looking at optimal carbon tax in 2020 on the left and uh, temperature in 2100 on the right. Um, and these variables, and this is showing you the average kind of like level in the tree where the variables first appear. So again, you're kind of looking at damage to natural capital being really important. Um, and then these next three are kind of all variables related to, well, first the initial natural capital stock rate, so that's just how much is there, as well as how important it is in, is it in these production functions? Okay. And so finally, so this gets to kind of Richard Hall's question, the question of defensive investment. Um, and so uh, what's, important, what's important here, so we're asking here, which is can we invest so as to reduce the impact of climate change on natural capital, right? Um, and this is really important because we're adding this additional damage pathway, um, but if we kind of don't allow, um, you know, the economy to kind of adjust so as to, um, you know, to offset those those damages, then we we could be missing kind of really important like adaptive, uh, certain types of adaptive spending. And so, for example, I have this picture here, right? We know that that we do spend right to to um, maintain and improve natural capital, right? So this is um, this like famous like microlite where there's these like endangered cranes um, that you know need to go on this migration, um, and so they're being led by this microlite. I think it's like down the east coast of the United States. Um, and so green dice kind of assumes the only way to reduce impact to natural capital is through greenhouse gas mitigation, right? And we want to kind of relax that assumption uh, and see what that does. So instead, we allow um, for consumption to be diverted into um, replenishing the stock of natural capital, right? It, um, and, and what this does, it introduces a third optimization variable, right? So in dice, you optimize savings. You, you optimize the mitigation rate, and here we're going to optimize a third variable, um, the natural capital investment. And we do this two ways, and you'll see why I do it two ways, because they're capturing kind of things that are really conceptually quite different. Um, and so the first way we do it is we add a, um, it's called, called the adaptive investments pathway. And what this does is allows you kind of to take some output um, and to invest it in reducing the damages uh, from climate change on the natural, 
on the natural capital stock. Um, so we, again, this introduces parameters that are really hard to estimate. Um, we assume a convex cost function, um, and then based on some estimates from, I think that Bernie found from European Union, uh, we have this calibration point um, of 2.1% um, of gross world product could reduce uh, climate change damages by 50% on natural capital. And so given, and then we vary it up and down. And so this is showing you kind of um, these, these results um, allowing the, the kind of green line is that central estimate. And then the blue is if you have kind of cheaper uh, ad adaptation options and the, or the yellow is if they're more expensive. Um, and so what you see is kind of adaptive investments um, act, uh, act as a substitute for mitigation. Um, and that, you know, in that kind of, if you have cheaper adaptation options, then you do, you do less mitigation, um, temperature is somewhat higher, although it's still kind of nowhere close to the, the kind of standard dice result that's approaching three degrees by 2100. Okay, sorry. Um, and then finally, um, we also add this, um, we add a kind of investment pathway in which you we allow for output to be directly invested in natural capital in the same way that you can you are kind of savings in classic dice can be invested in that in uh, the manufactured capital stock um, and so we call this the asset investment pathway um, and we we use a kind of asset pricing uh, approach where the cost of a kind of natural capital investment relative to an investment in manufactured capital um, is the ratio of the kind of discounted welfare um, of those of those two. Um, it's a, it's a it's a kind of future welfare streams discounted uh, of those of those two kind of capital and types of capital investments. And so, um, so what happens if you do this, if you kind of relax this, this constraint on the um, level of the natural capital stock, you see those kind of really striking uh, results in terms of what the, mo what the model is doing. Um, so what the, the model does to optimize in this, in this situation is um, you, you, basically you have this huge kind of immediate investment in the natural capital stock of like, you know, 30% of gross oil product, um, which, which kind of enormously increases the natural capital stock. Um, and it uh, kind of increases, it more than triples it, right? Um, and, you know, this is not about climate change, right? What's going on here is, um, this is mostly not about climate change. It's suggesting that the current stock of natural capital either is suboptimal or the welfare effects are being overestimated in green dye, right? And probably I suspect there's reason to think both of those might be the case, right? If you think of kind of natural capital, the kind of source of non-market, non-priced kind of goods, right? Then kind of very classic um, externality and public goods problems associated with the provision of that. So there's very, there's very likely that it would be uh, kind of provided at a suboptimal level. Um, but it also might well be that, you know, our central parameters are kind of overestimating the, the welfare effects. And um, we are not able to kind of distinguish between those two explanations. <clears throat> Okay, so conclusion, and then hopefully we'll have time to um, talk. So natural systems are directly exposed and vulnerable to climate change. Um, and if natural capital kind of plays a particular role uh, in supporting economic production and welfare, then this has important implications for welfare and maximizing climate policy. Um, the central estimates increase the social cost of carbon in 2100 by a factor of five um, and eliminate emissions by mid-century, stabilizing warming below two degrees C. Um, and it's largely driven by use values, at least in our central specification. There's high sensitivity to uncertainty in the damage function, although it doesn't kind of qualitatively alter this behavior. Um, and the availability of, of, availability of adaptive investments is important and can function as a partial substitute for mitigation. Um, finally, um, I'm sorry this is a long quote, but I think it's like really worthwhile. Um, so this is from Marty Weitzman's paper about this question of how um, non-market goods like appear in the damage function, of, uh, sorry, appear in the utility function. And it, here he kind of points to something that I think is really important, which is that these are, these are structural uncertainties, right? And so he says um, the vulnerability of like um, forms of utility function or damages is an unsettling empirical finding for the economics of climate change. Um, and with this kind of fundamental non-robustness, 
the outcomes are held hostage by core structural uncertainties about how high temperature change and high productive capacity should be combined to yield utility. Such a dismal message is not intended to bring despair to the economics of climate change, nor to negate the need for future study. Um, instead, this message is another warning in a growing series of cautionary tales that particular applications of cost-benefit analysis, or IAM, to climate change seem more inherently prone to being dependent on subjective judgments about structural uncertainties than most other, other more ordinary applications. And I just think this is an important piece to bear in mind when we, if we think about the, you know, what drives these kind of key structural uncertainties in these cost-benefit assessments um, of climate change that can really kind of overturn kind of what, you know, what is being, what, what the kind of um, the model results are. Um, and that, that I think is the kind of the main contribution here is to kind of point to some important um, stru structural uncertainties um, in the climate change. Uh, climate change damage estimates. And so thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, uh, thanks, Francis. And <clears throat> unfortunately, we cannot uh, applaud you, but uh, thanks for the great talk. Thanks for being time. We still have 10 minutes to go. Uh, the way this platform works is uh, that if you have questions, please just type them in, in the, uh, in the question tab. So there are some questions coming in and I'll try to translate them and try to jiggle around between the two screens. The first one relates to the, uh, DICE, um, the DICE framework as a whole in terms of both the climate part and also the abatement and mitigation parts. Mm -hmm. Those you didn't change and uh, mm -hmm. also explain the difficulty in getting people very low temperatures. We had a, did a sweep semi in a webinar uh, two weeks ago by Simon Dietz. Mm -hmm. Elucidating on, on the on the fallacies of the climate modeling bias and how easy it can be fixed uh, uh, through carbon budget equation or other uh, use form approaches, and also on the mitigation side, there's no obviously you showed patterns of emission drops already in 2020, which is uh, obviously highly realistic. To what extent these um, non-adjustments to dyes that you have made that you kept, I assume, for keeping consistency with the original model, do, do you think would affect your results if uh, if, if at all? Yeah, I think that that's definitely right. Should I stop sharing my screen, or or I guess I could if I go can go back to stuff. Um, yeah, that is definitely right. So, uh, oh, sorry. Um, so the um, yes, we don't change the climate model in Dice, and we don't change the mitigation cost function. Um, and in terms of the climate model, yeah, what what kind of um, Simon's paper is pointing out is that um, in particular, kind of the particular problem with the DICE climate model is that it, it kind of basically takes too long for a temperature to respond. And that there's evidence that um, the kind of warming from a pulse of common um, emissions, kind of some peak warming from that occurs just like 10 years, 10 years later. Um, and that's kind of much faster than what's currently um, represented in DICE. And obviously because of discounting, that kind of temporal response is, is important. Um, so you, so I suspect that if we were to update um, the DICE climate model um, to respect or to reflect that, you you kind of see more dramatic effects, right? Because that warming um, has a more immediate and therefore more costly um, effect. The mitigation um, cost absolutely says, you know, as much as we talk about the problems with the damage function in DICE, kind of the mitigation cost function has as many, if not more problems. Um, and so I definitely, you know, don't, I, I think the way to understand these results is kind of conditioned on this mitigation cost function. Um, what it's showing you is it's not, I'm not trying to say that, you know, this is what we should do in the real world, um, but it's kind of showing you that um, you know, this, this behavior, these damages are much larger, right? And because the damages are much larger, it means they're much more, um, you can, you know, there's a lot more mitigation, um, much more expensive mitigation that's going to pass the cost benefit test. Um, what that means in the real world, when you have kind of capital constraints and you have um, inertia and, and so on, um, you know, people that do kind of, you, a, lot of, a lot of you guys, I think, right, that do kind of more, um, serious energy modeling would, um, you know, have more to say, I think, about that. Um, but definitely, I suspect, yeah, some of those kind of really, really quick uh, emissions drops would probably change. Um, but that would definitely, it would be really super interesting, right, I think, to, to think about that. Right. In general, I mean, there's very little uh, 
a presentation of mitigation strategies in, in DICE also yeah. in the long run in terms of CO2 removal or climate engineering or whatever, which yeah. might also yeah. play a role here. But uh, there are coming questions. I have two questions from Richard. Uh, and unsurprisingly, has done a lot of work on this. So I'm going to read them through. The first one relates to um, saying the valuation studies estimate the net present value of species going extinct. You use this to calibrate the economic impact on the natural capital stock. Does this not double? This is not double counting these impacts. Um. Well, I don't think it would be double counting because um, we, when we take those damages, right, we kind of split them. Well, we try, it, to the extent they're already embedded in the DICE damage function calibration, right, when we try to apportion um, those damages, right, what we're doing is we're trying to split out, okay, you know, what damages, you know, what studies are including non-market effects and what studies are not, um, and um, and therefore kind of what fraction are they contributing to the total damages. And so if there are studies that say for, you know, like calculate this, you know, net present value of species extinction, um, then those would go into our non, our, um, uh, a non-market damage function and those would get applied to the natural capital stock. Um, so I don't think there's, um, there's double counting here. It's more just like apportioning um, the damages, and so not not kind of forcing everything through this kind of one pathway of everything just affects economic output, and therefore this single consumption good. Thanks. Second question is about uh, defensive investment. Mm -hmm. Essentially, what Richard says is that without them, you have an input in your cop diagnosis production function that can only fall over time yeah. and this causes problems in the long run and affects transversality conditions and growth path uh, as well as in earlier years given the dynamic nature of dice yeah that's, yeah that's definitely true right and that's kind of part of the motivation of of doing this um the allowing for this um these alternate specifications um the question so it is true that you kind of put this the variable in the, in the production function, right? And then in our base case, it's just kind of fixed, right? And then it just falls because of temperature change. Um, the but the counterfactual of that, I think, is not this like okay, well, we we do this perfect optimize we do this optimization, right? Uh, where we like triple the natural capital stock because clearly um, there are these other market failures happening here. Um, which I think do constrain the, the value of the natural capital stock, right? And so you can think of this as, as kind of solving the climate solving the climate policy problem in the in the second best setting where we also also have these large, you know, really substantial market failures around the natural the level of the natural capital stock. Um, and I definitely think this would be this again is like also something super interesting, I think, to to kind of be exploring in, in future work. Because I think particularly those last Results that I showed really point to yeah the importance the importance of that. Questions on on uh, geographical detail and spatial detail of uh, and heterogeneity of, of 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 ecosystems. Obviously, you're using a global model. You're using mostly estimates coming from developed countries. To what extent this work should and would be influenced by expanding this regionally, and can can it be done also? Yeah, I think um, um, I know like for Bernie um, and for myself is kind of it was really interesting question to kind of put some kind of regional variability on this. It's particularly important if you look at these estimates of like what fraction of country's wealth is in natural capital, um, they vary a lot by income, right? So it's lower income countries have like large fractions of their of their capital stock are uh, natural capital, right? Um, and they also play a kind of larger role um, in the um, in production in those countries, right? So you have this, you know, I, I, I repeatedly pointed to the importance of the the these kind of variables around how natural capital appears in production as being important in driving like our aggregate results. But those will also be important in driving these regional variations, right? And to the extent you have these core countries heavily reliant uh, on natural capital, um, and you get these damages from climate change on natural capital, that's going to have these kind of large um, regional um, effects on, on on how that welfare is kind of distributed around the world. And so, and there are these estimates, right? So World Bank has some of these estimates and so on. And so I think we, in terms of how um, 
how the natural capital stock is distributed between countries. And so I think that's definitely something where we're kind of going to be moving forward on in the future. Great. We're almost at the end and there were other questions about whether the paper is available or not. And I guess this is good news. Maybe you can, I think the paper has been published, so it's, it's yeah. accessible. Yeah, it is. So the paper is, um, was published just like a week ago in uh, Nature Sustainability. Um, and so um, if you Google the title, you should you should be able to find it. Um, or if you have any trouble accessing it, you can just shoot me an email and I would be happy, happy to send it over. Oh, well, great. Thanks a lot, Fran. It was really an exciting piece of work and it's hopefully it's going to open uh, further work along the road. It seems very, very promising. Thanks for being with us at such an early hour. Thanks to all the participants, almost 200 attendees. And I remind everyone next week, Wednesdays, 3 p.m. European time, uh, we sweep uh, webinar series is always on. All right, talk to you soon and thanks. Thanks to everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity.